Today's reading is from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. The word of the Lord. Children are dismissed if you'd like to head out to Children's Church. And while they're doing that, I don't know if you realize this or not, but to make Holy Week happen for the decorating team and the sound team and the music team takes a lot of work. You, you should give them a round of applause. Amen. Thank you, thank you. They, uh, Carol walked in this morning and said, this is beautiful. Kelly, you did such a great job. Kelly wasn't even here. <laughs> There's, there is a big crew that does a lot of work behind the scenes, so thank you guys for making this happen. Hey, guess what? He's risen. He's risen indeed. Yes, he is. You know, I woke up at 3.50 this morning, not because my alarm went off, but because it's Easter. Because I just, this is my favorite. I like every Sunday we get to gather together, every Sunday we get to talk about the gospel. Every Sunday, we get to talk about the amazing and incredible truth that even though we are far more wicked than we would ever dare imagine, I mean, so much so that God had to die for us, we are also far more loved than we could ever dare imagine that God chose to die for us. And that is the truth, friends, that we get to celebrate every day, certainly every time that we gather here to worship Jesus, but even more so on a day when we get to talk about resurrection on a day when we get to talk about what Jesus Christ has done and how what he did changes our everything. And it struck me as I was looking at Luke, but also at Matthew and Mark and John, at the four gospel writers, those eyewitnesses who talk about all of Jesus' life. And frankly, for most of them, the, the books that they write is kind of like a prelude to this week and this moment. When you look at all four gospel writers and their descriptions of the resurrection, it's pretty apparent that, you know, there's a whole bunch of ways that one can respond to the resurrection. And this is a sidebar, but one of the reasons that I trust these documents and I trust this book, that it really is the inspired word of God that my life is built upon, is because when you read it, there are, in fact, a variety of responses to the resurrection, and not a single one of them is someone going, yep, makes sense. Not one. Every single response is someone going, you, you're joking, right? Every response is someone looking and going, that can't be true and it can't be right. Their initial response is to go, I, no. And yet it is as they come to encounter a risen Savior that lives are changed no matter how the people initially responded. So all I want us to do this morning is I want you to just think about some of those responses. We're going to look at the way that the women and the men and Peter respond to the resurrection. And, and let me just tell you on the front end, my goal is not to convince you that one response is better than all of the others. What I really would like is that we look and actually listen and say, Jesus, how do I respond today? Now catch me. I'm not asking you how you responded 10 years ago, five years ago, or even five minutes ago. How in this moment are you and I responding to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because I can tell you that my response has changed. And from one season to the next, my response changes. So all I really want is for you and I to be honest enough with for ourselves and the Lord to say, how are we responding in this moment? 
to the historical moment that changed everything, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because what we're going to discover is that, frankly, it doesn't matter how you are responding. What really matters is that he's going to show up. So here's the first way one can respond to the resurrection. You can revere a dead man. Let's start at the beginning. On the very first day of the week, so Sunday morning, on the very first day, three days after Jesus died and was buried, we are told very early in the morning, probably earlier than 6 a.m. for those of you who showed up to sunrise looking sleepy. Very early in the morning, the women, now you know who those women are, right? These women, Luke names them for us later on. He says it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and some other Mary as well. He says these are the women who have been following Jesus for the three years of his ministry, okay? That means these are not just women who just came off the street having never heard of this guy. These are the women who have uh, slept in the same place everybody else slept as they followed him. These are the women who have prepared meals for him, who have sat at his feet listening to his teaching. So that means these are the women who heard Jesus say over and over and over again, I will be betrayed and handed over to sinful men. I will be crucified. And on the third day, I will rise again. Guys, that means that they they know the gospel story. They know the promises that Jesus had spoken. They, they knew him face to face. These women knew Jesus better than you and I can begin to imagine because they walked with him and they heard him say, I'll be betrayed. And they watched it happen on Thursday night. They heard him say, I'll be crucified. And they were there on Friday when he died. These women, we are told in the Gospels, follow the body of Jesus. They follow his corpse to the tomb. They see it sealed. They know that everything he has said up until this moment is true, which should mean that very early in the morning, they should be standing outside the tomb going, okay, it's going to happen. He's going to bust out. And what do they do? Very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, surprise, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, a couple angels showed up. These women got up that morning, and the only thing on their mind was Jesus, okay? The only thing on their mind was finding Jesus. As a matter of fact, they even see him as the Lord Jesus, And that is the very first time in all the whole Gospel of Luke. We're at chapter 24. We're at the end. That is the first time in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus is called Lord Jesus. Those women got up that morning going, this is no ordinary man. He is God in the flesh. They got up uh, committed to him, devoted to him, but convinced he'd be dead when they got there. They showed up that day to revere a dead man. And when he wasn't there, Scripture says they were wondering about it. Now, that word in Greek means something like they were perplexed, befuddled. They, they, they couldn't comprehend what was happening. There was supposed to be a dead guy there, one they could revere. Now, listen, I'm going to pick on the ladies because I think I probably would have joined them. If Jesus had said to me he would be betrayed and crucified, I would say, yep, those two things make sense. When he got to the third one, I'd have gone, I don't know about that whole resurrection thing. If I watched him die, I'd have shown up with the spices too. My issue is when you and I still relate to Jesus today, you and me, to revere a dead man. You know what I mean, right? You see, here's the thing. Uh, Dead men, they don't speak. Just saying. I've done a lot of funerals. It has never happened. If it did, I'm quitting doing funerals. <laughs> Duh. You can come to a dead man and you can say anything you've ever wanted. A dead man will never contradict you. Dead man will never speak back to you. You can love a dead man and he cannot love you. You can show up and you can say to a dead man, I will keep the promises that I made, but the dead guy can't keep promises for you. It is completely possible that you showed up this morning with the only thing on your mind and heart was that you wanted to revere Jesus Christ. 
that he is your Lord who you love, who you worship, who with everything that you have you want to serve, and you treat him like he's still dead. If it is a shock to you on the days when Jesus speaks and he contradicts you, you might be revering a dead man. If you live in such a way that you have stopped praying for him to keep his promises because you don't think he actually can or will, or you don't come to him to tell him about what's going on in your mind and your heart because you don't think that he cares, there is a very good chance that your response to the resurrection of Jesus Christ is to say, I still think he's in the tomb. So you can be here today and love Jesus, and you still treat him like he's dead. There's a second way to respond, isn't there? Because not everybody revered that dead man. Only the women went. The men said, well, he's dead. You can also reject the story. Now, I picked that word, okay? You can't reject a fact. I mean, you can. You can tell me that the earth is flat. You can do that. You can reject the fact that it's round. That doesn't make it not true. But you can reject a story, especially the way that these guys did. See, Luke goes on and he says in verse 9 that when the women came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. So the women came back, come to the upper room where the men have been hiding because they didn't want to end up on a cross like Jesus did. And they come back and they say, hey, we, we really thought there'd be a dead guy there we could talk to. And as it turns out, the tomb was empty. And instead, there were two angels who accosted us and said, why didn't you think that he would not be here? And when the women come back and they tell that to the men, we pick up again in verse 11, and it says, but the men did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Now, I'm going to let the women who's telling their husbands just go ahead and get that out of your systems. Nonsense is not a positive term, in case you're curious. <laughs> in its uh, Greek language, nonsense means that the men looked at the women and said, you are making that up. Or it's like the men looked at these women and said, you are so grief-stricken that you have just conjured up a fairy tale in your little head because it makes you feel better. That's what they said. They looked at the women and they said, you're so heartbroken and you have no hope that you have just created a story that makes you feel good, but in reality is not based on any truth and any fact, okay? That's one way that you and I can respond to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some of us revere a dead man. We heard, we know all about, okay, he's supposed to be resurrected, but we treat him like he's dead. Some of us, though, have just flat out rejected the story. And the truth of the matter is, guys, there's people in this room today, and you know who you are, who in your heart of hearts, you think that the concept of a God who became human, who suffered and bled and died and then rose on the third day, and that everyone who is in him will live for all of eternity, you think that's the stupidest thing you ever heard. That it's nonsense. It's a fairy tale that people tell themselves so that they feel better about bad things. Some of us are there because you actually believe that, you know, 2,000 years ago people were just stupid, but now we're smart. I would like to point out to you that nobody expected nobody that day. But some of us have arrived at that. We function as those who think that this story is just nonsense a fable that you can get nice morals from, a fairy tale that can make you feel better. Because we've walked through experiences in our lives that just make it hurt so much that we find ourselves looking and going, this can't be true. I got there and I was in seminary. That's pastor school. That is an awkward place to be at. And all of a sudden think, I think maybe everything I've ever been taught to believe about Jesus Christ is just a made-up story. And I didn't get there because I was studying this. I didn't get there because I had some teacher that you know, tried to convince me otherwise. I got there because I was in seminary for three years, and in three years, four people in my family died. 
The first one was my grandma B. It was my dad's mom. And the truth is, I had been estranged from her for more than 20 years. So when B died, it didn't hurt much. It hurt because I had to go do a funeral for a woman I'd been estranged from for 20 years. And I didn't even know how to do her eulogy. I literally had to interview my cousins. And it hurt because it hurt my dad, who I had also been estranged from and was just recently getting back into relationship. But she died, and it did not impact my day-to-day -day life. And so I went back to seminary, and life kept going. And that was fine until everything in my maternal grandparents' life went wrong. It was one of those situations where, uh, for those of you who grew up in church, you know that the prayer chain. If you didn't grow up in church, prayer chain is where if something's going on in our world, so we want people to pray for it. Uh, nowadays, it used to be a phone call. Now you send an email to the pastor and I, everybody's supposed to pray. Their life went so haywire that you reached the point where I just went, I, I, I cannot call the pastor and ask him to pray one more time. They went from perfectly fine to everything wrong. And first it was my grandfather, who was this huge man. And he was huge in stature, but he was bigger than that, like just in my world. Because I had been estranged from my dad, and my pap was everything. And this very strong, very stubborn, very stubborn man got a brain tumor. And all of a sudden, he became the smallest, most scared man I'd ever seen. Who died before I could get there. And I had to do this funeral. And I had to stand in a pulpit and say that there's hope. And within a month, a few months after that, my granny could no longer live by herself because she started to have uh, trans ischemic attacks, TIAs, tiny strokes. And eventually, they culminated and just accumulated to the point that they left her unable to speak. But they left her able to cry. For a year, if that woman was awake, all she could do was weep. I would get my mother's phone calls. And at the same time, her husband got prostate cancer. And she said, tell me again that there's hope. And then my grandmother died, and I had to do her funeral and stand in the pulpit and tell my whole family that the gospel is true, and this isn't nonsense. And then my dad died. And I was done. And I tell you that, because if you sit here today and you go, I kind of think this. I kind of look at life and I go, I don't, I don't know. This seems like nonsense. It seems like a story that we tell ourselves so we just feel better when life sucks. I get it. That is one way to respond. You can respond to the resurrection by revering a dead man. You can respond by rejecting the story, saying, this is nonsense. Or you can respond by running to the tomb. You know, all the men heard the story, and they did not believe the woman, women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. But Peter, Peter, however, got up and he ran to that tomb. Peter, who had been hiding with all of the other men in the upper room. Peter, who was terrified that he would get lumped in with Jesus. Peter, who up until that moment had said, I'd rather hide, I'd rather deny even knowing Jesus than run the risk that they'll arrest me too. Peter said, I don't care anymore. And he ran to that tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wandering to himself. What has just happened? Peter's one of my favorites. I mean, if you know Peter's story, right, you know that in just chapter 22, so uh, three days before Thursday night, Jesus had told Peter after the Last Supper, we were here Monday, Thursday, we talked a little bit about it, that Jesus had told Peter that by the end of that night, Peter would deny him three times, and Peter, being Peter, had said, essentially, over my dead body. When Jesus was arrested, this is verse 54 of chapter 22, it says they led him away and they took him into a house of the high priest. Peter followed, but at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and they had sat down together, Peter sat down with all of these people who had just arrested Jesus. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight, looked at him really closely and said, that man was with him. But Peter denied it 
Woman, I, I don't even know that man, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also were one of them. I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another person asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he's a Galilean. Peter said, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Then the Lord Jesus turned and looked straight at Peter. Peter went outside and he wept bitterly. The last time Peter saw Jesus, that was it. It was Jesus looking at him the moment that Peter had denied him three times. So all of a sudden the women come back and they say, we think, we, we think that maybe he's not dead. We think he did what he promised, that he is in fact alive. And the only thing Peter can do is run. He said, I got to see this. And he gets to the tomb and he looks in and, and he, he looks and he says, this is so weird. Someone took the strips that would have been wrapped all around Jesus' body to pack embalming spices closer to him. He says, someone has taken the time to unwrap, fold up, and kind of put them away. Like, well, we won't need those anymore. And Peter stands and looks in there and the scripture says, and he began to wonder. And when the women wondered, they are perplexed and surprised and befuddled and going, this is not what's supposed to be here. This word wondered means he hopes. Like Peter's looking in the tomb going, please, let this be true. You know, one of the ways that you can respond to the resurrection of Jesus Christ is you can hear this. You can hear that you have a God who died for you and a God who rose again, a God who conquered the grave, a God who gives second chances. And you can hope with everything in you that it's true. Because guess what? It is. Now there are three different ways that you and I can respond. And, and my guess is that at this point you know where you're at. You can revere a dead man. You can have Jesus be the whole center of your life but treat him like he's never going to speak to you, doesn't love you, can't show up, doesn't intervene, can no longer keep his promises. You can reject the story. Either because you have always been determined, that's stupid. Or because life has gotten to the place where you find it really, really hard to believe that it's more than just a nice story. Or you can even run to the tomb, hoping with everything in you that it's true. It actually doesn't matter which way you respond. Because the onus has never been on us. I don't care how you respond to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All those people and all of us are still rescued by the same risen Lord. So let me talk to you for a minute. If today you've been revering a dead man, I need you to do what Mary did. Mary Magdalene is one of the women who went to the tomb the first time, fully prepared to revere a dead man. And when she does not find him, John's Gospel says she went back. She goes back to the tomb. Now, she's still looking for a dead guy. Right? She still thinks that someone just hauled his body around a corner somewhere. But she goes and looks. And when Jesus calls her name, everything shifts and all of a sudden she realizes, I'm not serving a dead man, I serve the man who still calls me. If you have been, either your whole life, or maybe it's more recent, coming to the place where the only way you can see yourself responding to Jesus is to act as if he cannot actually speak or show up, he doesn't love, he doesn't keep his promises, you're treating him like a dead man, I need you to go to the tomb. You gotta let Jesus call your name. And then listen when he does. And the number one way you're going to hear him is you're going to get in this word. And you're going to have to actually do some work. Like you've got to read these promises and then say, I choose to live like my Savior is alive. I choose to speak to him like he's alive. I choose to be quiet so he can speak back because he's alive. When you do, you'll find that the Savior you've been serving is even better than you could begin to imagine because he happens to not be dead. If you've been rejecting the story, then let me talk to those of you who've rejected the story, because in your minds, this just is not possible. 
You think everybody in here, even the grandma that you came for, is a little bit nuts. You think they've been nuts for 2,000 years. You know, the men looked at the women and said, this story is nonsense. And my favorite part of the Gospels is that Jesus did not come back to them that night and go, you should have believed them. He shows up that night, comes into the room, appears to all of those men who thought that the women were nonsense, who thought this was just a story, and he says, come here, look at me. And he invites them to look at wounds, and then Luke's Gospel says he ate some fish and some bread, and he just says, I'm here. (laughs) Would you like to deny that I'm standing in front of you and I just ate your dinner? He says, come and look. If you have denied the resurrection of Jesus Christ, acted like it is not a historically verifiable fact, said Jesus isn't risen because you've just decided it's not possible, can you have enough intellectual integrity to come and look? If you spent this next year just reading the Gospels, actually reading the eyewitness accounts of who Jesus Christ is, the eyewitness accounts of how people's lives are utterly transformed by him and still are, You, listen, you won't find a watertight argument for the resurrection, but you will find a watertight person. One who is unlike anybody you've ever met, whose claims either are that of a complete lunatic or of your Lord. Why don't you come see? Actually, that's how Luke came to become a Christian. Luke wasn't there at the resurrection. Luke was an investigative reporter who came and said, I need to know if you people are crazy. And he met Jesus. And if the reason that you're rejecting the story in this season of life is because it just hurts too much to even try to have hope, I need you to look at his wounds. Let Jesus show you that the greatest pain anyone has ever experienced, he's still feeling. He knows what you're walking through. Some of you have heard me say this before because I'm a preacher and I just repeat my stories. My father died right before Easter, and I was not in a good space. But I showed up to church because I was going to revere a dead man, or at least people were going to think I was going to. And my pastor, he wasn't, he was a great pastor. He's a really bad preacher, like boring as could be. Okay? Oh my gosh. He had a sermon from uh, John 20, and all he did was stand in a pulpit for 45 minutes and say, that when Jesus came to the disciples that night, he stood among them and he said, peace be with you. And he showed them his scars. And he spent 45 minutes saying, there is peace in our brokenness, there's peace in our hurt, and there's peace in our pain, and there's peace uh, in in, in the suffering of this life because their scars are still on the risen Savior. That he took it all and he understands. And I sat in that pew and I rejected every bit of that story. And I said, No, there is no peace, and I'm not convinced that he's risen or real or any of this. But I looked real nice, and I mumbled through some songs, and I went back to seminary where I studied to be a pastor. And the next Sunday, this will be the Sunday after Easter, I came to church, and my pastor, whose sermons were long and boring, who read them to us, stood in the pulpit, and he just stood, he manuscripted everything. He stood in the pulpit, and he looked awkward, And we were like, what's up? Did you forget that you read? Like, what's happening? And he said, I wrote a sermon for today. I did. I swear to you, I wrote one. And we're like, okay. And he said, and this morning, the Lord just told me I can't preach the sermon I wrote today. I have to preach the sermon I already preached last Sunday. And for 45 minutes, he stood in the pulpit. And he said, the risen Savior comes to you and he shows you his wounds. And he says, peace be with you. Because there is nothing that you walk through that he doesn't, including the pain you're in now. And I don't think I've ever wept as much as I did that day. You see, Jesus made a whole congregation suffer through the same sermon twice. (laughs) So I would know that my Savior is alive. If you have rejected the story, you need to look at the wounds and find a savior. Listen, it's not that the story is too good to be true. It's that my expectations for the story are far too small. 
And if you've been running to the tomb, maybe today you run into the tomb for the very first time, you're hearing the gospel, and you find yourself an awful lot like Peter, going, I need a second chance. I, I need to know that there is hope. I need to know that I can be forgiven, that the things of the past don't define who I am today. Or you've been running to the tomb for years, years. You keep coming going, I want this to be true. And Jesus says it is. And you go, but not for me. Peter ran to the tomb that day. He spent the whole next week scared out of his mind (laughs) that Jesus meant it for everybody except him. The week after, Peter and and his buddies are out fishing and they look on the shore and they see uh, someone has made a fire And Peter goes to look, and he goes, it's Jesus. And the next thing you know is Peter jumps out of the boat and goes swimming to Jesus, leaving everybody else with all the fishies. And he gets there, and Jesus says, Peter, you and me are going to go for a walk. And if I were Peter, my heart would stop. Because I would be thinking, I'm going to get it. You know what happens instead, right? Three times... Peter denied Jesus, and so three times Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And after every single time, all of them, he looked right back at Peter and he said, then do what I called you to do. You see, the call that the Lord had put on Peter's life didn't get taken away because Peter needed a second chance. Nothing you and I can do can take away what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross and in an empty tomb. Nothing. So if you've been running to the tomb good. Now run straight to Jesus. Because he is the God who says, in him, you and I have abundant life today and for all of eternity. In him, we're made new. In him, if you were here Monday, Thursday, those names you left down, they stay down. Because in Jesus Christ, you are given new life, new purpose. And there is, if he can forgive Peter, I think he can forgive you. We're going to invite the band to come forward as we prepare to come before our Savior. And as we do, we're going to invite you to pray. All I can do is tell you about Jesus. All I can do is listen for myself about Jesus. I can't pray for you. I can't respond. That's for you. So if you today need to come before Jesus and say, I choose to stop treating you like a dead man, then come tell him that. If today you need to come before Jesus and say, "I, I think it's a story and I've been rejecting it, Invite him to show you that he's real. And if today you need to say, I've been running to the tomb and afraid to actually let you change me, then come and let today be the day that Jesus makes everything new. However you need to respond, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that today we get to stand in the incredible, unbelievable hope that we serve a risen Savior. We serve a living God who knows us by name, who comes and shows us that you are very much alive, and you even do so still bearing the wounds, the pain, and the suffering of where you died for us. You are the Savior who calls us by name, who invites us to know that in you we are made new. Because though our love for you will fail, your love for us never ceases. Lord, I pray on this Resurrection Sunday that this would be a day where we are resurrected in you. If there are any here today who do not know you as Savior and Lord, this would be the day where they go from dead to alive. And the Lord, for those of us who do know you, this would be the day where you invite us deeper into your heart, uh, further into your truth, that, Lord, we would go further up and further in to the truth and the beauty and the wonder that is our Savior. Jesus, thanks for loving us. We pray these things in your name, Lord.
And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand.